Well, it's my pleasure to come here and speak with you tonight. Uh, this is my, uh, my first public speaking ever, so <laughs> I'll do my best. <clears throat> As uh, Terrence said, my great-grandfather prophesied his, father's, his grandfather's birth um, in 1891, and exactly one year to the day, Isaac was born. Um, my family came from Caracalla, as did the Shikarians, and many of you know the, the story behind that if you've been around Full Gospel uh, and Deimos. Uh, the boy prophet who prophesied almost 60 years prior, 50, 50 years prior to the Armenian genocide in 1918 for our families to leave, not only to America, but to come specifically to California. <coughs> There's one of the remnant, and I'm another of the remnant. There's numbers of us. I have a deep history and DNA, a spiritual history, and um, I have some notes here. Bear with me just a second with the new, so I stay on track. Uh, but the God, God has a providence to us in our call. Everyone in this room has one. I have one, you have one, you have one, you have one. The, answer, the question is, is, do we answer that call? Part of what this conference <clears throat> theme is, leave no one behind and answer the call. Mine began again almost 150 years ago with my spiritual heritage. Um, I cannot ignore my family's spiritual heritage. God's purposes are manifest in our life when we say yes to Him. My pastor often tells us that the three most dangerous words that any of us can pray is, Lord, use me. I prayed that prayer. As I mentioned, the Armenian Genocide was commenced in 1915, actually. We just celebrated this year the 100-year commemoration of that. If I could have the first so slide up, please. When I answered the call, for years, three or four years now, I have been pained and anguished by our brothers' treatment, brothers, our Christian brothers' treatment in the Middle East, uh, to the point where I couldn't sleep at night. I saw the rampage of religious intolerance in the, in the, in the version of what they're calling ISIS right now, and it broke my heart and filled me with some despair and honestly some rage. I couldn't sit still and watch our brothers die. The, the tragic irony of this picture is I'm standing next to the 100-year commemoration of the Armenian Genocide that was erected three or four weeks before I showed up in an Armenian village on the edge of the Tigris in northern Iraq. I couldn't stand still and let our brothers just perish without the world knowing. My call took me to northern Iraq. Following the Lord today or at any time really never is easy, but it's not complex either. Our brothers are being slaughtered for their faith today, as you and I are sitting here. Unspeakable, depraved, demonic entities are trying to wipe them out just for standing up for Christ. Those are the same demons from hell that slaughtered not only the Armenians, 1.5 million by most accounts, probably another 700,000 Assyrian Christians, uh, countless Greek Christians, 
and many, many, which you may hear in the news today, the Yazidi peoples, who are not Christians, but are peaceful, loving uh, God's creation. To me, it was as simple as God's greatest commandment to us through Christ. When asked, what is the greatest commandment? Christ responded with, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love others. It's that simple. In case we don't get it, John 21, Christ told Peter three times, because he was a little thick in the head like me. There's a few thick in the head Armenians, right, Richard? All right. Christ told Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. So I embarked on a feed my sheep trip. I just couldn't stand it anymore. The people who said they were helping people on the ground often weren't. To me, it was an integrity issue to find out who's on the ground, who's helping our brothers, and who are feeding the sheep uh, so that I could come back and mobilize the American church and really the worldwide church. That's what we're sitting here in front of today with all of our brothers from all over the world. I finally said yes to Christ. I found a translator, a guy that would take me around, a wad of cash in my pocket, and I was about to order a plane ticket. My, my lovely uh, bride said, Mike, I really would like you to go with somebody. I said, well, that's a terrific idea. <laughs> I shouldn't go by myself. I was prepared to go by myself, but I shouldn't go by myself. And so I prayed, and as you can imagine, it's not easy to find somebody with that kind of uh, crazy scheme uh, to hop on a plane with me, but the Lord provided somebody amazing. And while I only went to go feed the sheep, um, Christ provided me people to travel with that exponentially increased the impact I had on the ground. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of time in this meeting to talk about it. The point is, is when you say yes to Christ and you say yes to God's call, God will bless that beyond our wildest dreams. The things that I could say would take two and a half hours and we don't have that. You all, some of us would probably go to sleep. <laughs> but if I could just have the second slide, please. As I traveled through and listened to the, 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 the amazing stories of despair and torture and just unspeakable things, I actually became quite despondent about why was I here? This is too big of a problem. God led me to this man right here. His name is Murat Varanian. He's the mayor of an Armenian village, the same Armenian village I just took that picture in. And Murat is a, a man's man. He is a Christian brother. And I was able to give him one of Demos's original books in Armenian. Now, the reason I need to set this up, when I say he's a man's man, he fought for Saddam against Iran for nine years. So the picture I'm going to show you, it, it's a great picture, but it, do not be put off by it. Uh, if you'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, you'll see Deimos there and your lovely mom, Rose, right? And he was quite, quite touched that I was able to bring this to him. He couldn't believe that I came all the way across the world to come see him. But I was able to tell him that God hasn't forgotten you. God hasn't forgotten your people. And you, sir, are here because God placed you to be here. He kept telling me, I don't know why I'm here. I don't know why I'm here. I don't know why I'm here. He personally fought off ISIS as they came to his town. All the rest of the towns ran. He stood with his men and fought them for 20 days straight. Yeah. Next slide, please. 
This is just the Armenian language version of the happiest people on earth. The kind of the thing that, that uh, set it all off. Uh, if you would go to the next slide, please. This is what it really is all about for us in this room, prayer. This is an Ephesians 6, 12 battle. We fight, our fight is not against flesh and blood. Our fight is against powers and principalities and wickedness in high places. I ran into the high places that also include many of the Western governments, unfortunately. This particular photo from my elbow up is ISIS. It's the Nineveh plain. Mosul would be right under my sword of the word, the Bible. If you could see it, it's a little hazy. Mosul was changed uh, some thousand years ago by the Muslims from Nineveh. It is ancient Nineveh. This is the most ancient part of Christianity. If we call ourselves Christians, this is where Christianity started. Under my elbow on the right is the city of al -Kush. After I left, I learned it was the burial place of Nahum the prophet, the book of Nahum in the, ba the back of the Bible. But what I'm here to do is to connect myself with Richard and our family history and the amazing, amazing connection that's there, but also to call us all to pray for our brothers and sisters. We have to pray unceasingly. We have to start firing flaming arrows in the spirit to this part of the world. These people have backed themselves back to a corner, and it, it's up to God through people to make a difference there. So I know there are prayer warriors in this. There's not an accident that the very first place I was invited to speak was here. I've not spoken anywhere. I literally just got off the plane within, what, three, four weeks ago. And so I don't have a prepared <laughs> talk. Um, but I'm here to call you to prayer for our brothers and sisters. 1 John 3, 8 tells us the Son of God, that's Jesus, His purpose in the world was to disrupt the plans of the devil. And that's what we're all, we cannot call ourselves a follower of Christ and ignore that purpose. And the greatest evil, I used to say before I took the trip, this is the greatest evil since the, not the Nazis, but the SS of the Nazis. After my trip and hearing the depraved evil, it's the greatest evil in the last hundred years for sure. Certainly our lifetimes in this, in this building. And so this is what motivated me to go. God bless the trip beyond my wildest dreams. Again, I'd love to spend more time talking about it, but it's just not the time here. Uh, and what I'd leave you with is, you know, ask yourself, what is your call? We all have a call. If you haven't said yes to that call, What are we waiting for? Michael, we're going to have a special prayer for you, but I prefer to do it at the very end of the service and call all of the ministry men around you and anoint you with oil and pray for you. And, and I'm so happy that this is your first time. <laughs> You didn't know that, did you? No, I didn't know that. <laughs> but God is going to fill your mouth. You're not going to need your computer. You're not going to need your notes. You're not going to need anything. They're going to say, what happened to Michael? <laughs> God bless you, Michael. We love you. God bless you, brother. So God is still performing miracles.
I know many of you may not know him intimately, or maybe not had that privilege. It's very difficult when there's so many people for him to spend a lot of time personally. But I want to testify to you before God that this man is absolutely real. He is a wonderful human being, a great, and to me, a mighty man of God, walks in forgiveness and love, and that is not easy. It isn't. And he does that in a way that distinguishes him and gives him, in my eyes, and those who know him, a very rare dignity, and thereby it is my honor and privilege to introduce him as your speaker tonight, Dr. Shakarian. Just keep talking. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. I told Terry you should just keep on talking. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. We have some wonderful treats, and tonight you're going to really receive a lot of very special things from the Lord. So we're going to just open our hearts to that. But uh, first, I want you to just turn around and, uh, you know, this is a fellowship, right? So let's have fellowship. Find out who's at your table, who's at the next table, and say hello to them, okay? Yeah, honey. I, I can't forget it, honey. Lord, you use you tonight. The Lord, you That's right. We're Lord, gonna, use you. We're gonna have a drink. Don't sing You tell me. I'll, call, I'll be calling you. I'll give you specific instructions. Okay, good. Well, you all look happy. Anybody happy out there? Say, amen. Well, you look real happy. Okay, please be seated. When did we go to Armenia the first time? I can't hear you. 1990. Yeah. Thank you, honey. I got you up here. They said I married the prettiest girl. She was the prettiest baby in Rochester, New York, and I think she still holds the record. Minnesota. And she still holds the record. Give her a hand. How do you like that? It was 1990, and the Lord was dealing mightily with the Eastern nations and Soviet bloc. And um, the, the leaders of Armenia, who were the puppets of Moscow, would come to Los Angeles for various reasons. And they heard about my father, and they wanted to meet him. And they heard the word businessmen. You know, communists are very interested in businessmen. And so they contacted him and wanted to have lunch with him. And my dad said, Richard, drive me up to Los Angeles. I'm going to have lunch with these men from Armenia. So we would go, and he would, he would keep roping me in. My dad would keep roping me in. 
And uh, they wanted my father to go to Armenia, but he was not physically able to do it. And so he kept inviting me to go to L L.A. and then to Armenia. But I didn't want to do it. First of all, I knew it would cost me personally at least $10,000. And besides that, I knew the people were suffering. And unlike Michael, I didn't want to go where people were suffering. I just hurt my spirit. And I didn't want my spirit to be hurt that bad. So I kept declining, no, no, no. Now by that time, Vanjie and I had already traveled in more than 50, that's 5-0, more than 50 nations of the world. Wow. <laughs> Oral Roberts had sent us to about 27 nations around the world to carry the gospel, and we had made many of our own trips and we had traveled at more than 50 nations. It's a lot more than that now. But I didn't want to go. And then there was a full gospel meeting up in Sacramento, and a man was coming to speak by the name of Slavic Radchek. And we sat there and listened to him as he told how God was working behind the Iron Curtain. So on the way home, Vance and I decided, if God was over there, it was okay to go. And so, thank you, Slavic. Because of that, I had some of the greatest events of my life, and I'll tell you about that a little later. Slavic, come on up here, give him a big, Big welcome, Slavic Radchek. God bless you. I understand by you here. Take the mic. Thank you, Dr. Richard, for two hours. What I have from you. Yeah. Two hours. Yeah, it's any, good. Any time but tonight. <laughs> you got four hours any time but tonight. <laughs> When Moses was in wilderness, he did not expect big miracle and historical moment because God turned around everything in his life. God saw how Jewish people working very hard in Egypt. And God gave a promise to his son, Abraham, saying, after 400 years, your people will go to promised land. But Moses, raise up, because I see tears from women and men, from children. I see broken heart, and I have in my promise to bless them in Holy Land. Moses, take off your shoes from your feet, because place where you stay is holy ground. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you some true story. In very short and brief, my message. Just a few days ago, I met this friend of mine, he is the evangelist. He came to me and he said to me, just a few weeks ago he got invitation from 20 billionaires from New York. Can you come and talk to us? And he said, okay, I will. When he arrived, they shut down office and they started talking to him. And they said, I know evangelists need funds for a ministry, but please don't talk to us about money. We are tired 
Because all years we were working very hard to get a lot of money. But our heart is broken, our family broken, our children broken, our relatives broken. If you have a word for our heart and heal our spirit, money will come. We need word from God. Ladies and gentlemen, few years ago, Brother Richard, his wife and daughter came to Ukraine and started full gospel businessmen of Ukraine. Hmm. Igor is here. And now thousands came to Christ last year, because now Ukraine under war. Last year, we were able to purchase 150,000 Bibles. And we mobilized hundreds of young people and sent it across Ukraine. And we distribute in Ukraine Bibles. Only in last year, God helped us open over 400 new churches. People need God. Heart is broken, spirit broken, young generation broken. I was able to travel across Indonesia with the leaders, and I saw how God used for gospel in Indonesia, in Papua. And I'm asking foreign people, people from overseas, you are in America. America is a holy place, holy country. God created this nation. When few pre first president make constitution, he stay by knees and he watch Bible and make constitution. And now I am telling you, no any parliament, no any congress, no any supreme court cannot change the word of God. Because God on the throne, He's Alpha and Omega, He's first and one, He's coming very soon. Revival coming to America. America, wake up. Foreign people, please help America. America sent missionaries around the world. America sent funds around the world, for gospel businessmen around the world, millions of people around the world because of America. God bless America from ocean to ocean, from north to south, from east to west. Pray for America, preach in America, save people in America, because hell for devil, but heaven for us, our families, our children, our wives, and our husband. God bless you all. Hallelujah. Join me in the altar service when I pray for the people. Sharon, would you sing that beautiful song, One Word from God? <clears throat> now just open up your heart and let the Holy Spirit minister to you. And he's going to do that tonight. No. 
you know that I need that one word from you tonight? Shh. You know that I need that one word from you tonight. And Lord, you know the man I prayed for when I felt that tremendous pain that his nation needs that one word from you tonight. Lord, so many nations are in pain. So many people are in pain. So many here have suffered and in your name we speak to you Lord Lord if ever the world needed you we need you tonight Lord we pray for America and we pray for the world that the will of the Father shall be done on earth as it is in heaven Now, Lord, let your anointing come into each one of our hearts. Open our mind to your thoughts, Lord. Open our hearts 
to your spirit, Lord, and let us receive your possibilities. In Jesus' name, amen. Now turn around and give somebody a big hug, and then you can be here. It was 100 years ago this year that there was a tremendous massacre in Armenia. But prior to that time, God spoke. Michael's great-grandfather prophesied to my great-grandmother and great-grandfather, and the child was born exactly one year later. But that wasn't the only prophecy, because an 11-year-old boy under the power of the Holy Spirit in a little Russian church in 1855 wrote pages of beautiful writing. It looks like it came out of a machine. Impossible for him to do. But he gave the word of God that there would be a terrible massacre and atrocities in that place, and that they would flee, should flee to America and all the way to the West Coast. Then he did the most unusual thing. He sealed the prophecy, and he wrote a second one, which has not yet been opened, and he sealed that one. And he said, if anyone opens these prophecies, unless God is in it, they will be destroyed. And it was many years later, in 1900, when the prophecy was opened, 45 years later. Can you imagine? Hanging on to a prophecy you didn't know what it was, and waiting, waiting, and 45 years later, he said, this is the time. And they opened it, and it gave instructions to leave. And so they sold their possessions and left their beloved homeland and beloved village to travel to a country that they didn't know, to a language that they didn't know, to a place that they didn't know, to jobs that they didn't have, because they believed in the prophetic word. And if Michael's great-grandfather had not believed in the prophetic word, and my great-grandfather had not believed in the prophetic word, we would not be here today. And what's more, Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship could have never been born. God protected these families. He protected something. He was looking down the road he was protecting you by protecting these families. And because of this, Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship came into existence many years later. You know, um, our family moved to the flats in LA. Well, the flats was a very uh, difficult and humble place. And it was one mile and one year from the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Azusa Street. <clears throat> and the church was a wooden structure with wooden floors, wooden benches with nothing soft on the benches, and no backs on these benches. And that's the way I grew up in church. And down the road was the Russian church, and um, the Molokans, and when they felt the spirit, they would jump. Now, they were pretty big. <laughs> I like to think of them as 300 pounds, but I was pretty small, so I'm not sure how big they really were. And when they would jump, the floor would, the floor would go like this. And, and in those humble beginnings, they sought the Lord and began a new life. And my 
great-grandfather who had the faith to come over did not last long in this country, and he perished. And um, many people perished. The population of the Armenians was two million before the massacre started, and after that, it was only about 385,000. So you could see that it was a wipeout of Christianity is what was attempted. You know, the devil has tried that before. Herod tried it with Jesus. And wherever the light is coming through, there's an attack. And the devil always attacks in an unfair manner. And you know, sometimes all of us get a chance to the opportunity to consider our place before God. And more than once when I have been attacked, I've said, well, Lord, am I really any value to you? And I'm sure that you've had similar experiences where you, where you questioned your self-worth or your worth to God. And you know, the devil is always telling you a lie. He's always saying, well, you're not worth anything to God. Why are you struggling so hard? Why are you trying to go this place or that place? Why are you trying to do? Why are you trying to give so much money away? You know, you're not, it's, you're not really appreciated. You're not really worth what you think you are. You're not worth anything. God doesn't regard you. And you know, whenever the devil talks to me that way, I think of my great-grandfather who by faith obeyed the prophetic word and preserved his family by coming to this nation. I think of my grandfather Isaac, who was my best friend when I was growing up, who taught me all of the old world ways so that I could easily deal with so many nations, who was a great man who prospered and live the life of Isaac in the Bible. And I think of him, God, thank you for Isaac. And then I think of my father, Demos, who changed world Christian history by opening the door to the charismatic, to all of the churches that had not really received it, Catholic, Methodist, Presbyterian, etc. And today there's a great charismatic revival in Spain and in Italy among the Catholics, and it's being led by our dear brother from Spain. Where are you? Stand up, stand up, please. Stand. Let's give him a real hand, all right? Thank you, my dear brother Luis. God bless you. And I think of my dad and what, hap what he did and starting the fellowship which has gone all over the world. And then I think of myself and I say, well, Lord, what, what value am I, am I to you, Lord? And then the Lord seems to whisper to my heart, you were born for a reason and a purpose. And think of all of those that have come to Christ all of those. And I believe that God has more for me down the road, which has been prophesied and which I'll live long enough to live out those prophecies. Amen? You know, the best thing to do is to just live a long, long time in good health. Right, Jimmy? Live a long, long time in good health and see all of God's promises come true in your life. How many of you are carrying a promise that's not fulfilled yet? Wave your hand at me. Wow, Lord, you've got a lot of work to do. Start tonight. You've got a lot to do. I remember my dad in the early years 
Well, my, my dad and granddad, we, they lived in houses on the same property. And our family was always close in that way, especially the men. I don't know what it was, but there was something about my grandfather, my dad, and myself that drew us very close to each other, and we understood the same things. Nobody had to tell us. We understood that we belonged to God. We understood that it was God that brought us here. We understood that God had preserved us. We understood that our life belonged to God. We understood that we had a ministry and a mission to accomplish. And that's why we threw everything in it, to do it. That's right. And in the early years, my, my dad would uh, say, Richard, jump in the car, and we're going to go down and have lunch with Dr. Price over here at um, Uncle Tom's uh, long log cabin. L Uncle lo John's, rather. Uncle John's log cabin. And there was this delicious Italian food over there. And we would go there, and my dad would sit by the hours, and I would sit with him as Dr. Price would prophesy. And he would tell of the great moves of God in the future. And he was right on, on many of them. He said, Demas, I won't live to see this, but this is what's going to happen in the next few years. And it happened, just as he said. And then there'll be a great move of laymen. A great move. It'll be the last great revival. And it's going to come through the lay people. And then he'd put his hand on me and he would prophesy over me. Now, I was too little to have a tape recorder, so I can't tell you <laughs> exactly what he said. But apparently God had something really good for me too. And he was prophesying it. And then later on when dad started the fellowship, he went to uh, this city, Houston, Texas. And he had a meeting here. And here comes a gentleman to him. And he said, uh, Demos, I know more about this fellowship than you do. My dad said, who is this man? Oh, he's Mordecai Ham. 10,000 men are in the ministry in the Baptist church because of him. A great prophet of God. Billy Graham came to Christ because of him. Great prophet of God. He said, Demos, God showed me this fellowship. You're going to go around the world. You're going to change the world. God is raising up the men of this last day. It's going to be a generational thing that's going to sweep the entire world. And it is the last great revival. Now here's a man that brought 10,000 preachers into the ministry, and he's saying it, the last great revival is coming through you guys. Through the man. Praise God. Now I'm talking slow enough so that the interpretation can go across in the different languages that are being interpreted right now. And so there was this anointing flow. It started with me early in my life. My granddad had a beautiful home, and he had tennis courts and outside kitchen. And, and you know, on the weekends, here would come the wealthy Armenian businessmen and the politicians. And he was very influential. But he loved God. My granddad loved God so much, and he wanted to witness to him. But sometimes it wasn't easy to witness to these politicians. So he'd be sitting in this great big chair, you know, in this great living room, and they would be sitting there. And uh, the other day I was in the, pre in the home of the president of Honduras, and it reminded very much of my granddad's house and the way the living room was laid out. And there my granddad would sit, and he said, Richard, come here, come here, stand by me. And I was about seven years old when it first started. Stand here by me. Why don't, he said, you know, 
Richie's rich, really going to be used by God greatly. Wow, yeah. He's going to be used by God. Let him tell you about Jesus. And I would start to witness to these big politicians, to these wealthy Armenians, multimillionaires, and my granddad would back me up in my witness. Well, that came in handy for me when I met men like the future chancellor of Germany, like Ronald Reagan, like 20 other heads of state, because I already had experience talking with great men. God prepares you, and he's prepared your life as well. And then came along a burning desire in my heart to win many people to Christ. So as a youngster, I would go up to the mountain and I, and in the camps, youth camps, and there I received the Holy Spirit. And it was there that I first saw the Lord and he laid his hand upon me. And the Bible says that Jesus Christ himself is the baptizer of the Holy Spirit. So last night when you opened up your heart, you may not have seen him like I did, but he puts his hand upon you and you receive the Holy Spirit from the hand of Jesus Christ. And the proof is that the Bible says that the Holy Spirit speaks about Jesus. And when I received the Holy Spirit, I was completely changed. I mean, I was almost 13. I walked out, it was about 1 a.m. in the morning, out of that chapel, up in the mountains, up above Los Angeles. And the stars were so brilliant, so beautiful. The trees smelled so fresh. Everything was so beautiful. My senses were all heightened because of the love of Christ. I went down the mountain and they couldn't shut me up. They could not shut me up. I witnessed to dad's banker. I witnessed to the shoeshine guy and won him to the Lord. I think he's in the ministry now. I, I witnessed to everyone that I could. I started Bible clubs. And eventually we had about 300 of them all across America. And they tell me it's possible that we had reached 10,000 souls for Jesus Christ, and I wasn't old enough to drive a car yet. That's why we have the youth meetings up there, because God wants to get into these young people, and that's the future where the blessing is going to come. God is going to raise up a new generation. I see a mighty army of God being raised up Praise God. So stay on fire so you keep up with them. Well, anyway, along the way I went to college and I had a beautiful car. It was a, uh, I loved cars. So I was driving this brand new Buick Century convertible, which was the car of the time. Italian, special Italian spoke wheels. I had a good job, by the way. and. Beautiful Italian spoke wheels, red and white, fancy leather interior, and I drove on the campus, and uh, then presently, I saw this beautiful girl get out of a car. It was Vanji, and she came early to the college campus, but she didn't last long. A few months later, we were engaged to be married, and like they said, it's been 60 years has gone by. Isn't that wonderful? Give Vanjie a hand for all this. Thank you, Vanjie. I served the Lord as best I could by continually putting on outreaches. I was always winning people to the Lord. I was always making sure that the poor or those that were in need had food. And you know, in the Lord's work, 
I don't think anybody is in the Lord's work that doesn't get their feelings hurt from time to time. If you're going to wear your feelings on, the, on your sleeve, you're not going to last very long. And we went to a convention in Florida, a world convention, and it was wonderful. But on the last day, something happened. Someone was very mean to me. And you know, I had had enough of people picking on me or saying things about me or hurting me. So on the airplane, I told Angie, I said, honey, we got to get out of the fellowship. I've had enough of this fellowship. We don't need this. I've always won souls to the Lord. I've done thousands of souls to the Lord before I ever heard of the fellowship. We don't need it. And so I was planning to exit. I was trying to figure out how to get out of the fellowship. And my dad said, Richard, I want you to go to Brighton, England, because there's a European conference, and I can't go, and I want you to go. And so he sent me to England. And the, it was a nice conference. And after it was finished, late Saturday night, Bruno Berthon and his beautiful wife, Chantel, which looks like the Statue of Liberty, by the way, beautiful wife, <clears throat> said, we want to pray. I didn't know what we were going to pray about. I didn't know if they were going to pray for me or I was going to pray for them, but we found a ballroom that was vacant, dark, and we slipped inside, sat down there. Chantel began to pray in the Spirit. She prayed in the Spirit a while, and then out would come a one-liner, boom. Then she would pray in the Spirit a while, and another one-liner would come out. I'm just going to read you a, just a little bit of that because it changed my life. She said, it's hard to say it, you know. It's hard to say it because she said, I will take call your father back. You're going to call my father back? I began to cry. Do not go out. Who told her? Nobody knows. Who do not go out. Wow. You have not found your place yet. You will find your place. You will shine. There'll be great changes in the fellowship. Don't be afraid. I'm in control. I have a place for you. It's reserved for you. There's something inside of you. It's different from your father. You will shine as a star. You will shine in a different way than your father. Isn't it wonderful that God doesn't make duplicates? When you find your place, all that I've put into you will come out. It will pour out like many waters. I see your feet with wings on them, quickly traveling the whole world. The rushing of the Holy Spirit by your feet. Beautiful are the feet of those who carry the gospel. Something about me, about the Lord, that is unknown that you will bring into the world. All that is within you will come out. I am your father. You are my son. I love you. I love you. Don't let these things disturb you. You are loved. I am your father. Begin to realize that I am your father. Wow. 
I, I, I cried most of the night as I tried to remember what she said, and there's more to it, and wrote it down in order in the best way that I could. And this was given on um, July 31, 1992. And I became president of this fellowship, I think it was in the second week of July, the following year. Less than one year, boom, do not go out. I, I've, I very seldom read that, but I felt it's important for all of us to understand that the hand of God is leading this fellowship, and we have to stand back and let God lead this fellowship. Did I hear an amen over there? Later on, I had another prayer that I prayed. I remembered all of those things that Dr. Price, Dr. Mordecai Ham, and many others had told my father. I said, oh God, you gave my father many promises, some of which he never saw. Lord, I want to see those promises that you gave my father. And out of that came in a very extraordinary meeting in the nation of Hungary in Budapest. And we can do it again, fellas. We just have to decide that we are one body, not a group of selfish entities. We've got to work together. I uh, guess unity. My dad kept saying, break the mold but he couldn't tell us what that meant. He said, the Holy Spirit keeps telling me, break the mold. Well, the mold got broken with a big bang, and that was the great outreaches outside of the chapters, the knocking down of the chapter wall, the going out and reaching the sinners and bringing them in because we couldn't get the whole city inside our chapters, so we went out to them. But I remember praying that prayer to see those prophecies fulfilled. And one day we were in the, uh, was it uh, Switzerland, in the mountains there, in the Alps? for Austria, in Austria. And Mickey came to me and he said, there's a lady here to see you. She is with the government of Hungary. And she is a member of the government. And we've been witnessing to her. And she has a portfolio with the government to be the head of the religious affairs of Hungary. But she's come to our meeting, but she doesn't want to receive the Lord. And so she sat there with her driver, and she had come to talk to me about TV or some other things. And the men in Europe completed the meeting, and they said, Richard, would you like to say something at the end? I told the story of the Good Samaritan in a different way than I had heard it all my life. It just came upon me and I said, it's time for the great nations of the world to get off their big white horse 
and get down into the ditch and pick up the fallen nations and take them in to be healed. Now this woman who had just come out of communism not long before, she turned to my wife and she said, oh, this is wonderful. And then we sat and ate at long tables, family style, European style. Bruno was sitting on one side of me, Angie on the other. Mickey was there, President of Germany was there and others. And she was sitting right directly across from me. And I just pushed my food aside and I just kept talking to her about the Lord, talking to her about the Lord, talking to her about the Lord. And pretty soon I could see she was ready to receive the Lord. I said, Magnolda, would you like to receive Christ? And she said, yes. So I said, give me your hand. She gave me her hand and we prayed. And all the tables, they erupted in joy for this one had come to Christ. She said, would you, would you bring the businessmen to Hungary? I said, well, if you'll give us a place where we could openly give our testimonies, I'll bring the businessmen and the Holy Ghost. Oh, that would be wonderful. When will you come? Well, the Lord had given me a date that something special was going to happen. And I said, let me see a calendar. So they opened up the calendar. I said, right here on this date. Mickey said, oh, no, Richard, you can't do it then. Why not, Mickey? Well, that's a religious holiday. It is exactly 1,000 years to the day when Hungary's St. Stephen committed the nation of Hungary to God. I said, praise the Lord. God chose the date. Heaven is going to celebrate. And it was wonderful. We printed up 100,000 newspapers telling of the miracles of Jesus and telling of the miracles in the present day. And we set real strict rules of how the meeting would be run. We did not run a normal, what we would call a chapter meeting at all. We ran a meeting to reach them for their miracle and their healing because we knew that miracles would reach them. And I told the workers the night before, miracles, we must have miracles the very first day. Pray, pray all night if you need to, but we've got to have miracles the first day. And they took their allotment of papers and two young big guys went and prayed all night. And they went out to the train station and they started giving away their papers. And they saw here was a guy laying down on a dirty cloth and he couldn't walk and he had a cane and he had a box to collect some money in and he had a sign about his disability and they said here would you like to hear about Jesus and he said oh I'm glad you came and they started talking to him and pretty soon the Holy Spirit from their night of praying all night and believing, came upon one of the young men, and he said, silver and gold we don't have, but in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. Woo. Now here's a guy that couldn't get up. Here's a guy that the caretakers around there had to try to wash him. In the name of Jesus, rise and walk. Well, he didn't get up fast enough for these two big guys. So one on one side, one on the other, grabbed him, and picked him up and started walking him. Yeah, walk in Jesus' name. I mean, they're going to walk him. Walk in Jesus' name. Walk in Jesus' name. Walk in Jesus' name. Run in Jesus' name. Run in Jesus' name. Suddenly, the power of God hit that crippled young man, totally healed him in mid-step, and he took off running, screaming, miracle, miracle, Jesus, heal me. Miracle, 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 miracle. You know me, I'm the baker. Miracle, miracle, miracle. And for three days he yelled in that uh, train station, miracle, miracle, you know me. Well, that's the way we started. 
That was the first miracle. Then every night there were blind people that received their sight. There were deaf people that received their hearing. There was one miracle after another, after another, after another. And then after it was done, one of the nearby towns, the mayor said, come over to my town. And, I, and the fellows accepted. Before I knew about it, I wouldn't have done it because we had no preparation of any kind. We didn't even have a microphone. We didn't have a stage. We didn't have anything. Nobody knew we were coming. So we went out to this town, and they got a microphone together and got it plugged in, and we're standing on the concrete there. And before we started, we were, they are trying to get together uh, the things, so we were having a coffee. I think it was at a McDonald's there in the park. We are having a coffee. And, but, but I noticed that there was an ice cream shop uh, uh, across the way. You know, I can, I'm an old dairyman. I can find an ice cream shop anywhere. I just, you know, I just twist my spoon and it'll point right to the ice cream shop. I have a built-in, I have a built-in detector. So, so Vanjie came presently, and uh, it was very hot. And she said, you know, I'd like an ice cream. I said, good. I know where there's a shop right across the way there, across this park. So we walked together by ourselves over to the shop. And when we got to the ice cream, we saw these three girls. They were, I would say, in their late teens and early 20s. And one of them was horribly crippled. She was the worst case of spastic I had ever seen in my life. She could not walk forward. To make forward progress, she would have to go like a crab one way and then another. And I felt so sorry for her. I didn't feel any Holy Ghost feeling of, you know, grab her and heal her, not at all. I just felt really bad that any of God's creatures should have to live like that. Well, we got our ice cream, and we walked to the other part of the park, and then we all got together and went over where they had set up the microphone. And I said, now look, we're open in an open air in public, so everybody, nobody takes more than three minutes. We'll give a quick testimony, quick song, quick testimony, quick song, keep going back and forth. Well, I want you to know that we had all week been under the glory cloud all week. And so presently as I was standing there speaking, I see this girl, this crippled girl, standing there. She was completely healed. No one touched her. No one prayed for her. She got too close to the glory. <laughs> what happened to me? And then they led her to the Lord. One story after another I could tell you, but I'm going to cut it off right there. I had a very touching one down there in Honduras recently. I went there and they said, Richard, uh, there's a newspaper lady in the coffee shop. She'd like to interview you. Well, I was going to the coffee shop for breakfast, so I said, that's fine. So I went over there and so she began to ask questions and I would answer it. And then I began to tell the stories of lives that were changed, of people that were healed, of homes that were put back together, of children that started to love their parents once again, of love reuniting husband and wife, of families put together. As I told these stories, she started to cry. And this newspaper reporter, I noticed tears are falling on the table. Tears are falling on the table. And so, would you like to receive the Lord? And our men prayed for her. And she received Christ, and then she said, you know, I didn't realize how much this job had taken out of me. I've been a reporter for seven years, and yesterday I had to cover the funeral of a young lad that had been killed. And it was so sad but I didn't feel anything. And then the father came, and he was crying and telling me about his son, and it was so sad, but I didn't feel anything. But when you started telling these stories, 
I felt human again. And that's how she accepted the Lord. You're carrying something inside of you that is so powerful it could touch the hardest heart. Yes, you've got it. You just tell what God has done. Tell the good things. Tell what God is doing. And tell it under the anointing. I thank God that he saved our family, but all Christians have not been saved from their persecution. In Syria, I believe it is, an ISIS soldier captured a Christian and was set to execute him. And the Christian said, I know you're going to kill me, but I want to give you a gift of my Bible. And he gave the one who was set to kill him his Bible. And then the soldier killed him. But Later on, that soldier started to read that Bible. And the Bible began to speak to him. He didn't understand it, but he began to read it. And then he had the dream, the man in white. And so many people in the Middle East have seen the man in white and been called to God by him. And he said, why are you killing my people? Who are you? I'm Jesus. Come and follow me. <laughs> then he had the dream again. And this recurring dream was something he couldn't understand. So he found a famous Christian ministry, and he contacted them, and he said, I want to talk to you. Now, not too many of us would want to get that phone call. And they said, all right and they led him to Jesus. I see a mighty army in the future. It's of our young people of today. It is people of strong faith of today. This is the mighty army that God has, and he's going to raise up this army, and we're going to do the same things that Jesus did, the same things we did in the park out there in Budapest, <clears throat> the same things that we've seen in, around the world. We're going to see an anointing and a power that we've never seen before. Sharon, would you play for me, please? Get ready to sing that song again but I want you to play. <clears throat> God is going to use us in a mighty way, but we have to be willing to be used. It's not willing, it's not easy to put everything down in the altar, to put the way we live to put our attitudes, to put our selfishness, to put our money, to put our life. We want to be faithful to God as the bride of Christ, but only to a point. Only to a point. Okay, we're living in a different day and age. The, si the sun has turned. And the time has turned, and we're living in a different time. 
And if you're living in a half-time or a part-time or an 80% time, you're missing God entirely in this time because it's going to take 100%. I want to play a song for you. This is a song I went to the tailor shop. Vanjie said, you're losing weight. Let's get your clothes where they fit you. And we found this Armenian tailor. He had come from Baghdad. A wonderful man. And, you know, you just can't go in there and get your clothes fixed. I mean, he's going to feed you tea and pachlava and some other goodies. And you got to sit there and spend an hour drinking the tea. And then, you know, then you spend another hour because some of the Armenian friends come in. So I found myself sitting there with a group of Armenian men jabbering away in Armenian, of which I was getting about 20%, enjoying myself immensely, drinking this tea and eating this delicious food, all to get my pants taken in. Now that's the way to do it. And one of the guys says, uh, Richard, uh, I have something I want to play for you. I want to give this to you. So he went in the shop and he put this music on. And I said, what is this? He said, this is the song that the Armenians sang when they were being forced march into the desert to die. You're kidding. They sang? Yes. And this is the song. I said, I never heard that. So, Pete, if we could put that song on, please. I'd like... Their husbands were killed. The weak, the old people and the wives are being forced marched. Into the burning Mediterranean desert. At the point of a sword, whipped. To die. No water, no food, no care. The baby's crying. The mother's doing her best. This mother here is already carrying a dead child. And they're carrying them out where they're all being killed. Lord, forgive. Have mercy, O oh Lord, have mercy. O oh Holy Spirit, have mercy. Have mercy on us, Lord. I hear the trumpet sound. The trumpet is blowing, and God is gathering his people. Have mercy across the river. And then they were marched on out into the desert to die. Across the river. Thank you, Pete. Let me just turn that off. I don't want to get everybody crying. That was a hundred years ago. 
And it wasn't really that meaningful to a lot of us until we turned our TV on and saw the soldiers wearing masks and cutting off the heads of the Christians, killing them, to eradicate them, to steal their wives into slavery, to, to steal their property, to kill their children, to take over, receive a profit by what they were doing. Now I know how much God loves all of us. Because of his love, we were preserved. And they are also loved. But somehow, I could never get the answer to the question, Lord, why did they die and I live? Only heaven can answer that question. But the world is getting very mean-spirited. And the great nations that were the protector of the weak are now turning a blind eye. They're being compromised. The answer is to renew our dedication to God. Not just well, I had a wonderful experience with God in the past. Not just a 50% commission commitment. Not even a 99% commitment. God wants 100% of you. He wants 100% of you. I pray that none of us ever face that like the Armenians did. They could have saved their life by denying Jesus, but they wouldn't do that. God wants a hundred percent. A hundred percent. He has a word for you. And he has a life for you. And that's a word of blessing and a word of anointing and a word of power. He is going to raise up a mighty army. It may not be with swords, but it's going to be by the power of the Holy Spirit. The blind will see, the deaf will hear, the lame will walk. God will change people. And I believe that he's reaching right into ISIS to touch many people by the supernatural dream of the man in wife, white. Sharon, I'd like you to play that song again about the one word from God. While she plays that, if you want to make a greater dedication to God, just get up and come down here to the front. And we're going to dedicate ourselves to God in a very special way. Just get up and run down. That's right, just come on down. Sharon will sing and we will, we will make our own dedication to the Lord.
change everything just one word one word one word from God In oh the Lord we cry out at you tonight no hope inside we need that word from you Lord all your dreams are gone in this unique time of history there's nothing man can do it's impossible for you, you we step do. out so across the line to 100 percent dedication nothing else will help nothing else will do Thank you, Jesus. You remember, remember for all power and all glory and all authority God belongs to you. I thank you that you're not a million miles away. I thank you that you're not only in yesterday, you're not only in tomorrow, but you're in today, and you're right here in my heart right now. All of your power, all of your authority, all of your glory, all of your ability. of your people shall arise the cloud of glory Amen. as in Moses day and nothing shall be impossible Amen. my children I love you I love you I love you come on come on with me. Mm. Sharon let's have another worship song whatever you like just worship the Lord. This is a very holy moment as you're making dedications to Him. My Lord is coming back to this old earth again.
just talk to Jesus. Again. Never be afraid to talk to Jesus. I've got no time. Just talk to for him. Folly. Got no time to waste in sin for my Lord is coming back Jesus. to this old earth again. Now, Lord, I pray that you shall strengthen your people. Strengthen us, Lord. Strengthen us with the power and might of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we love you. And we know that you love us. And, Lord, we ask that you strengthen us now, Lord. Strengthen us for the days in which we live. And give us the power never to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But that the power Hallelujah. of salvation shall flow through us to the world. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name we praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Michael, come here, please. Come here, Michael. Michael, uh, just kneel down here. We're going to pray for you. Just kneel down here. Come on, fellas. I want these guys that are in the work of the Lord to lay their hands upon you. And I want to pray for you as well. Just, just anoint him there. Hallelujah. Michael, your family has a tremendous, tremendous anointing. The first time I met you, I felt that anointing so strong, it was with me the rest of the day. And now, Lord, I pray that you shall strengthen Michael, loosen his tongue to speak even more eloquently, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Let your glory be upon him. Let his face shine with your glory. Let the horns of anointing be upon his head, I pray, O oh God. Lord, you put something on his heart. Lead his steps so that he shall be able to help your people. Lead his steps. There's greatness in those steps, Michael. God is leading you greatness. Receive the miracle of God. Receive. Receive from God. Receive. Michael, Jesus loves you very much. You're very special to him. For you have heard his voice 
and answered his call. Many hear the voice of God, but not all answer. So, Lord, you are very special to him, and he is very special to you. So in Jesus' name, I pray that you'll bless him, give him the resources that he needs. Lord, give him the planes that he needs. Give him the ability to transform the nations. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Just open your hearts into his presence. Just open your hearts into his presence. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we've come from many nations. I, as I look across every view, I see many nations. I thank you for these precious people, Lord. I admire them for they leave their work, they go to work for you, and they witness and they speak, and they bring many to you. So, Lord, strengthen our hands that we not be weak. Strengthen our hands. For it is said that the glory of the Lord shall fill the earth as the waters cover the sea and shall cover the earth. Lord, as I look around, I see miracles in every view. I see what you've done for one and for another and for another. And I see their labors of love for you. Angie, come up here, please. Thank you for Bruno there, and I thank you for Philippe. Oh, Lord. A fresh and greater outpouring than he has never ever known. Use France, I pray, in a way that they cannot even dream would be possible today. Lord, use them for your glory. Lord, we could not imagine what you could do, Lord, so we don't try. We just say, Lord, move by your power and move in France. Move by your power. And let France become a great beacon of light, I pray. I pray for Philippe. I pray for all those chapters over there. I pray for those precious people that you'll give them a vision greater than they ever had. Greater than just reciting the vision, but give them a personal vision greater than they ever had. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I pray for Sweden over there. I see new fire in Sweden. Thank you, Lord. New fire in Sweden. Thank you. Lord, I pray for the Latin nations that they shall not take you for granted. Not take you for granted. Oh, Lord, but that they shall continue to be blessed mightily, I pray. Jesus. Thank you for Ghana. 
thank you for the DRC. Thank you for these nations, Lord. That we're surrounded by. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. How about hallelujah? Hallelujah. Just a chorus, okay? Isn't Jesus wonderful? Thank you, Jesus. You're so wonderful to us. Thank you, Jesus. You're so wonderful to us. Thank you for Susie, Lord. Thank you for Susie, Lord. Amen. Thank you for the Glory to God. Well, I, I didn't want to rush the Holy Spirit because you were enjoying the blessing, and so, so am I. Tonight, when you go to bed, just make a new dedication of your life to the Lord. Just say, Jesus, forgive me. I'm in 100%. Say it right now. Jesus, forgive me. I'm in 100%. Thank you, Jesus. As we're going, I want to tell you that tomorrow morning will be a wonderful breakfast with the Chinese. There's many Chinese full gossip businessmen that are coming. Some are brand new. So come here for the breakfast. You don't, I hope you've all bought a registration because that helps pay for the event. What? What? Okay, Roy, come up here quick. Also, I want to tell you, if you've never sat down with my father and had him tell you personally how he received the vision. Then we got a package there. Get it. It's a CD of my father telling the vision. And many things in our story we cannot say in the time allotted. So you get a book and the CD and you'll be greatly blessed. Now, um, Roy coming up. Oh, there you are. Roy, wait a second. Uh, Gabe, come here a minute. Gabe, we're having a fire team in California. Adler, there. Adler come on up. Adler, give us a privilege of what's going to happen in California. Okay. Before I, uh, before I start about the fire team, I just say, want to say bonsoir. <laughs> 